In the brief articles which will compose this series, my aim will be to present in the briefest, simplest and most practical manner the methods which, in my experience and that of many others who have been more or less under my influence, have seemed to lead to greater mental efficiency. It is said that there is no royal road to learning, and while in a certain sense this is true, it is also true that in all things, even in the training of the mind, there is a right way and a wrong way, or rather, there is one right way and there are a thousand wrong ways. Now, after trying, it seems to me most of the wrong ways, I have found what I believe to be the right way, and in these articles I will try to expound it. Do not expect an essay on psychology or a series of dissertations on the faculties of the mind, for there will be none of that. On the other hand, I will avoid as much as possible textbook terms and textbook tone, both of which are quite absurd and useless. I will try to give you the facts, I will try to give you clear instructions, stripped of all verbiage and all pseudo-scientific frivolity, for the acquisition of mental activity and mental supremacy. Chapter 1. The Mind and Its Matter In the first place, before you are able to think about anything, you must have something to think about. You must have some stock in mental commerce, and this mental stock in commerce can only be obtained through the senses, the appearance of a tree, the roar of the ocean, the smell of a rose, the taste of an orange, the sensation you experience when you touch a piece of satin. All this is material that helps to form your stock of mental images, the content of consciousness, as the scholastic psychologists call it. Now, all these millions and millions of facts that form our mental stock, the material of thought, are obtained through the senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, etc. Value of Perceptions In a recent article published in an important French scientific journal, a well-known scientist, Dr. A. Perez, has put forward some ideas which agree so fully with my own observations made over many years that I yield to the temptation to quote them. Dr. Perez points out, first of all, the modern degeneration in this respect. I enclose a free translation of some extracts which seem to me particularly worthy of attention. We have but arms and legs, have we not also eyes and ears, and are not the latter organs necessary for the use of the former? We exercise not only the muscles, but also the senses that control them. This is how a famous philosopher used to express himself. However, when we measure the sharpness of sight, we find that it weakens, the hardness of hearing increases, we suffer daily from the lack of ability of the workers, of the domestics, of ourselves. As for taste and smell, they are exhausted. Thus act the inevitable laws of atavism. The trouble is that despite Rousseau's objections, we have always paid too little attention to the hygiene and education of the senses, giving all our care to the development of physical strength and vigor, so that the general term, physical education, has finally assumed the restricted meaning of muscular education. The senses which bring us into contact with external objects are, however, of paramount importance. So great is their value that it is man's interest, and even duty, to preserve them as a treasure and to do nothing that would upset their marvelous mechanism. The length and accuracy of sight, the dexterity and sureness of the hand, the delicacy of the ear, are of value to the artist as well as to the craftsman because of the perfection and rapidity of the work which they ensure. Nothing embarrasses a man so trained. He is, so to speak, prepared for everything. His cultivated senses have become for him tools of universal use. The more perfect his sensations are, the more justice and clarity his ideas acquire. The education of the senses is the first form of intellectual education. The influence of sense training is easy to see. The skilled marksman never misses his aim. The savage perceives and recognizes the slightest rustle. Certain blind men know colors by touch. The precision of jugglers is astonishing. 
The gourmet recognizes the quality of a wine among a thousand others. Smell is for chemists one of the most sensitive reactions. The senses operate in two ways. Passively, when the organ, by the mere fact of being situated on the surface of the body and independently of the will, is actuated by external bodies, or actively, when the organ, directed and excited by the will, goes, as it were, ahead of the body to receive the impression. Passively we see, hear, touch, smell. Actively we observe, listen, feel, smell. Through attention and by arranging our organs in certain ways, our impressions become more intense. The impressions that external objects produce in the sense organs, the nerves and the brain, are followed by certain mental operations. These two things are often confused. We are in the habit of saying that our senses often deceive us. It would be more correct to recognize that we do not always interpret correctly the data they provide us with. The art of interpretation can be learned. The intuitive and concrete form given today to education contributes to the training of the senses, developing attention and the habit of observation. But this is not enough to perfect the senses and to make each of them, in its own perceptions, acquire all possible strength and precision. It is necessary to subject it to special, appropriate and graduated exercises. A new gymnastics must thus be created in all its details. There are, of course, a certain number of specific or racial impressions and tendencies which are transmitted through what is called heredity, but these are merely instincts and impulses, and although they have an influence on the character and habits of thought of the person, they do not in themselves provide real material for thought. Imagine a blind and deaf person who could not smell, taste, feel or move. He would be totally unable to think because he would have nothing in his mind to think about. The material of thought, the mental stock in trade, is obtained through the senses. And in any rational effort to train the mind, we must begin by training the senses, the perceptions, as they are more accurately called, so that we can see, hear, smell, taste and feel with greater precision and acuity. Trained perceptions are the very basis of all mental power. Our system of training for mental supremacy will therefore begin with a brief study of the perceptions or senses and of the methods by which we may acquire the power to see more clearly, to hear more attentively, to feel more delicately and, in general, to develop the powers. E, but perceptions are of little value unless we remember what we have perceived. You may have read all the wise books ever written, you may have travelled all over the world, you may have had all sorts of interesting and unusual experiences, but unless you can remember what you have read, what you have seen and what you have done, you will have no real use for it all. You will have gained no mental capital, no material by the use of which you can hope to attain mental supremacy. It will then be necessary for us to study not only the methods of developing the power of perception, but the means by which perception can be retained and recalled at will, the power of associating memories. But memory itself is not enough. I have known people with unusual powers of memory who could not speak, write or think well, who were like the book-laden, ignorant, red imbecile with a lot of erudite humour in his head, but who, in spite of all his experience and his recollection of it, had nothing to write, nothing to say. So, memory is not enough. One must have the power to unite the memories, to analyse, compare, contrast and associate them, until the whole mass of memories that form the content of the consciousness is a splendid and homogeneous whole, a mass of images, each of which is intimately related to many others, and all of which are under the instantaneous command of the central sovereign, the will. It will be necessary, then, to pay special attention to this most important matter of analyzing, comparing and grouping mental images. Of all the activities of the mind, this faculty called the power of association 
is the one that most directly leads to what is generally called a brilliant mind, imagination and judgment. The possession of trained perceptions, of a retentive memory and of great powers of association are of enormous value, but only when combined with another faculty, imagination. And imagination is nothing more than the power to recombine certain memories in such a way that the combination is new. Imagination is a faculty of the greatest possible importance. Every splendid thing, every invention, every commercial enterprise, every great poem, book or picture has not only been conceived but completed in the imagination before it became a reality in fact. And then it is necessary to be able to compare the mental images gathered by perceptions, recalled and classified by memory and association, in order to determine the relation of these memories to each other and their application to other ideas or mental images. And this valuable faculty of the mind is called judgment, necessity of concentration. Now, to do any of the things I have been writing about well, it is necessary that the whole mind be occupied with that one thing. To do anything well, one must do only that one thing at that moment. And this is particularly true of the action of the mind. The focusing of the whole power of the mind on one thing is commonly known as concentration or the power of attention. So essential is this power of concentrating the whole mind on the task at hand, that it is not too much to say that no great degree of mental power can be obtained without concentration. Therefore, in our study of the practical methods by which mental supremacy may be attained, we shall give special attention to the development of this invaluable faculty. But to do anything with the mind or with the body, for that matter, one must choose, one must desire to do that thing. And this choice, this decision to do something is called will, the power to choose quickly and decisively and to act energetically in accordance with that choice is something quite rare. He who has that power is said to have a strong will. This question of the will and its development is very important. The great difference between men, between strong men and weak men, between the honored and the despised, between masters and servants, is the will. A man of strong and unbreakable will is sure to succeed, even if his abilities are mediocre. But a weak-willed man, no matter what his abilities, is not likely to achieve either success or honor among men. As a great psychologist has said, the education of the will is really of far greater importance than that of the intellect. And also, without this will, there can be neither independence nor firmness nor individuality of character. Igmarvel says, Resolution is what makes a man manifest. Will makes giants of men. The will, like any other mental faculty, can be highly developed by training, and this with many practical exercises. We will also deal with this in its proper place. Importance of the social faculties the above brief description of the mental faculties covers those that anyone can develop and use without help or association with other people. However, the higher mental faculties, or at any rate the more impressive ones, can only be developed through contact with others, through social relationships. A man may have miraculously acute perceptions, a perfect memory, a splendid imagination, an unerring judgment, an indomitable will. He may have all this, and yet he would miss the rewards of mental supremacy unless he were able to deal with other people, unless he were socially accomplished. In our efforts to train the powers of the mind, therefore, it will be necessary to make a study of some of the principles which affect our relations with other people. And so, in the same practical and direct way, we shall discuss sympathy, adaptability and self-control. The important question of verbal expression, as applied to both speech and writing, will also receive special attention. Mental action as a unit. In conclusion, it should not be forgotten that, although I speak of the various mental acts as if they were separate, 
This is done only for convenience of discussion and description. In fact, the mind is one thing, a unity. All the various faculties act together constantly. One cannot remember what an oak tree looks like unless one has carefully observed an oak tree. He cannot imagine an oak tree unless he remembers it. He cannot judge the difference between an oak tree and a maple tree unless he can picture an image of the two side by side. And he cannot do any of these things without attention. Nor can he concentrate his attention without an act of will. We see then that the various acts of the mind, perception, memory, imagination, judgment, attention and will are inextricably interdependent and that one act implies all the others. Fortunately, this makes our task easier and more interesting. In this series, I will begin by giving you some practical tips for developing the perceptive faculties, the ability to see, hear, feel, taste and smell more effectively. But with each moment of practice like the one I am advising you, you will also be developing a more accurate and acute memory, a finer and more expansive imagination, a greater concentration of power and a stronger will. When we come to discuss the cultivation of willpower, the exercises will require the use of perceptions, memory, imagination and other faculties. Therefore, by developing the mind in any of the phases of its activity, the power and usefulness of the whole mind is increased at the same time and by the same act. Chapter 2 Training the Perceptive Faculties Man is the eyes of things. Hindu proverb. That clairvoyant genius, Goethe, once said that he regarded himself as the center of all phenomena, a kind of focus toward which they converged. Goethe also claimed that the true pattern of all things in life was simply the mass of actions appreciable by the human senses. In other words, Goethe understood perfectly well the educational principle, now widely recognized and widely ignored, that all mental activity is based on perceptions, on the things we see, hear, feel, taste and smell. We might as well try to build a house without wood, bricks, stone or mortar, as we might try to think without a good stock of impressions, images and memories gathered by the senses and perceptions, blurred mental images. One of the never-failing marks of the common mind, the untrained and inefficient mind, is that the mental images it contains are confused, fuzzy, inaccurate. A person with such a mind will tell you that a car just passed him on the road. It was a big red car. You will ask him, well, he doesn't know very well. It may have been red, but he thinks it was black. Possibly it was grey. How many people were in it? I think three, four or five. Ask him to give you a summary of a book he's read or a play he's seen and he'll feel just as helpless and so on and so forth. Such a person is the typical inefficient person. You will find thousands of such inefficients occupying unimportant positions in stores and offices. And even the trivial tasks of such positions they are incapable of performing properly. They cannot read a line of shorthand notes and be sure of their meaning. They cannot add up a column of figures and be sure of the result without repeated checks. Such wretches are the cast-offs of the commercial world, the unfit who, in the struggle for existence, must necessarily be displaced by those whose mental processes are more positive and accurate. It is almost unbelievable to what extent perceptions can develop. I personally know a bank teller who can detect a counterfeit coin without looking at it, judging only by weight, touch and sound. Another man I know earns a large salary simply because of his ability to judge tea through its taste, a tea taster. I know a conductor who, in the full fortissimo of his 60-piece band, detects a slight error from any player. I could give many other examples from my own experience of remarkable powers of trained perception. Perceptions are easily trained. To encourage those who are aware that they do not get the best possible service from their senses and perceptions, 
that they do not see all there is to see, hear accurately and clearly, etc. For their benefit, I can say at once that senses and perceptions are easily trained. One or two months of discipline, such as I am about to describe, will show a very marked and gratifying development in most cases. A few months' training is all that is needed, for the habit of close observation is soon formed, and once formed, no further thought is necessary. The matter resolves itself. Children's Perceptions First, a word about the senses and perceptions of children. Here is one of the serious defects of our defective school system. It practically ignores the fact that the child develops not through reasoning, but through observation and activity. The child observes everything. His senses are active and acute. Childhood is the time of accumulating observations and experiences. Later, they will form the material for thinking and general development. The child must be encouraged to perceive and remember. All the methods I am going to describe are applicable to children under 10 years of age. The more elaborate and extensive the mass of perceptions, memories that the child carries over from infancy and childhood to youth and adulthood, the greater, all things being equal, will be his intellectual possibilities. Most of us are starved for senses. Most of us are very deficient in mental imagery. In a test conducted not long ago in Boston, 80% of the children had no idea what a beehive looked like. More than half had no idea of a sheep, and more than nine-tenths had no idea of the appearance or nature of growing wheat. Of course, they knew other things that the country-bred child would not know, but imagine the loss in the imagination of one to whom the following lines awaken no vision of a pure and rustic morning scene. The call of the morning breeze, breathing incense, the twitter of the swallow from out of the straw shed, the shrill clarion call of the cock or the echo of the horn will no longer rouse them from their lowly bed. The great secret of a true development of perceptions is discrimination, the understanding of differences. To the savage, a sound is a sound. To the musician, it is unbearable discord or exquisite harmony. To the musician, a small depression in the ground, a bent branch, a crooked leaf, are nothing. To the savage, they mean food, an enemy, safety, or danger. On the printed pages, the unlettered rustic sees only silly black marks on white paper. But in those black marks, the educated man sees what makes his heart beat faster, what makes his eyes water, what tells him secrets of life that the peasant will never know. The differences are in the trained or untrained perceptions. Most of the exercises I am going to describe are very simple. Many may seem trivial. But remember, as a great educator has said, the point in education is the power of attending to things which may be in themselves indifferent, arousing an artificial feeling of interest. So the first exercise is simple enough. Simple, but not easy. Try it, and you will see. Take any object you want, a book, a pen, a pair of scissors. Place it on the table in front of you. Then take pencil and paper and describe it. Just tell what you see. Can you do it? I doubt it. Tell us its dimensions, its weight, its color, its shape, its markings, its lettering, its origin, its uses, its possibilities, its defects. See to what extent you can write about the object. You will probably not like the result. You will discover that you have nowhere near the capacity for expression that you imagine. No matter. With a little practice your faculties will grow rapidly. You can do the same outdoors. Look at a mountain peak, the ocean, a horse, a bird. If you think for a moment that there is nothing to write about these things, read the poem In the Valley of Chuni, the splendid passage in Byron that begins, Roll, deep, dark blue ocean, roll. The magnificent poem in the Book of Job, describing the horse, Shelley's, the lark, and so on. James W. H. C. Riley has said, There is always a song somewhere, my child, and to find the material for the song, it is only necessary to look with a refined and educated perception, 
to look trying to see all the various sides, all the many phases of the object looked at. In the same way, one must also study many other natural objects, autumn dyes, frost marks, snowflakes, trees, both their general shape and that of their leaves, all the common flowers. Finally, and in many ways most important in practice, get used to observing the human face closely. Try to recognize and discriminate the signs of education, refinement, intellect in the face, distinguishing it from the stigmata of ignorance, coarseness and brutality. Another good exercise for eye training is the following. I got a number of ordinary marbles, say three dozen, one dozen of each, red, white and blue. Mix them in a container. Now take a handful of marbles, take a look at them and throw them away again. Then write down how many of each color were in your hand. At first you will find this difficult. In a short time, however, you will be able to distinguish at a glance between, say, three red, five white and seven blue, and three red, six white and six blue, with a corresponding development of the faculties of perception in all other directions. A very simple and very good exercise for the development of the faculty of sight is as follows. Get a dozen white poster boards about three inches by five inches in size. Then, with a small brush or a pen, draw on each of them a series of small black circles. The circles should be solid black, about a quarter inch in diameter. On the first card, draw one, on the second, two, and so on to the last, on which you will make twelve. Group them as much as possible in a circle. Now to use them, put the cards face down and shuffle. Then take the top one, take a brief look at it, and try to perceive how many black circles are on it. Do not try to count during your brief glance, do not squint, frown, or strain your eyes. Just take a glance and then try to remember and count what you have seen. You may find it difficult at first to distinguish between five circles and six. However, after a while, you will be able to instantly decide on any number of circles, up to 15, 20, or even more. Train your ear to hear. Few people can hear. Of most, it could well be said that they hear and do not hear. I do not mean that in most people the organ of hearing is defective in any way, but that, as a result of inattention and lack of practice, they do not get clear and vivid impressions of the sounds impinging on their auditory apparatus. One of the best methods of training the auditory faculty is to listen attentively to the various sounds of the countryside, the buzzing of insects, the cry of the robin, the thrush, the catbird, the blackbird, the swallow. All these and many other sounds peculiar to the countryside should be carefully studied. The sounds peculiar to city life are less picturesque and, in a sense, less varied than those of the countryside. And yet, if we speak only of the musical advantages of the city, there alone we have material for splendid auditory training, concerts, opera, social music, the phonograph, even the hand organs of the street offer opportunities for ear training. These opportunities can be taken advantage of in various ways. One of the best and most practical is perhaps to routinely require us to know the melody of popular selections. How many people who are not musical know the melody of the soldier's chorus from Faust, the bullfighter's song from Carmen, or the overture to Tannhäuser? And yet these are things we hear every day on street organs. A very good exercise for the development of the auditory faculty is simply to listen to the ticking of a clock. One method I have found very practical and useful is as follows. Place the clock on the table at which you are sitting. Now turn your left ear toward it. Do you hear it? Yes, clearly. Move one foot, two feet, three feet, four feet away from the table. Can you hear the clock? Yes. Now increase the distance foot by foot until you can no longer hear the clock. Now listen, listen, listen. Concentrate your attention on the sound until out of silence or a confusion of sounds, the clear rhythmic ticking of the little mechanism comes to you. All this time you will be seated with the left ear turned towards the clock. 
The same practice should be done with the right ear. Of course, the same result can be obtained if two watches are placed, one on each side, and heard at the same time. It is not necessary to practice more than 15 minutes a day to develop remarkably acute hearing in a very short time. In addition, you have to get used to keeping your attention on sounds for more than a few seconds. Much of so-called poor memory is simply a matter of inattention. If you can learn to stay attentive, to concentrate on what you hear for a minute or two without distraction, you will make remarkable progress in hearing acuity. Taste training. Taste is a much more important sense than most people realize, and in modern life especially, this faculty can be of great value. In fact, it can be of almost inestimable value in many of our higher activities. The chemical analysis of food is based in part on this sense of taste, and in many cases, the infallibility of the results depends almost entirely on the acute sense of taste of the person performing it. There is a large industry based on taste. Evaluations of tea and coffee depend entirely on the sense of taste, and among the many senses, it is one of the easiest to develop. The tongue and palate can be trained almost at will. In general, their development depends on the attention paid to them and the attempt to distinguish between the different qualities of flavors. Each of us must develop an accurate and discriminating sense of taste. One method I have found very good is the following. Once a day, make an effort to savor your food, simply savor. Try to distinguish between the various elements. Try to discriminate the ingredients of a sauce, a soup, a stew. Then, test your own perceptions by repeating the operation with the same ingredients. At first, you will find it almost impossible to distinguish between such clearly differentiated elements as onion and garlic, cinnamon and cloves, sage and catnip. No matter. With a little practice, you will soon find that you can distinguish the subtler flavors. One method I have found very useful in developing the faculty of taste is this. Get yourself a dozen small jars and fill them with various substances that produce a strong characteristic flavor, such as vinegar, lemon juice, tomato sauce, vanilla extract, mustard, pepper, cloves, ginger, alcohol, etc. Then, while blindfolded, ask someone to take a bottle, put a small amount of the substance on your tongue, and see if you can distinguish it. Again, you will find yourself confused at first, but before long, you will be able to distinguish between the more subtle flavors. Smell training. The exercises for the development of smell are almost identical to those suggested for the development of taste. They are perhaps of lesser importance to most people, although even in modern life, despite the preponderance of the more active senses of sight and hearing, the olfactory faculty can have a very real value. Among the trades and occupations in which the keen sense of smell may be of great value may be mentioned chemistry, botany and pharmacy. Also, in many industrial jobs, the sense of smell can be of great use. The main point to bear in mind in training the sense of smell is the need to discriminate between the various qualities of odors. Here, as in most forms of sense development, the essential point is to learn to distinguish between the different qualities of impressions. It is not necessary to go far in search of material for this exercise. In the kitchen, at the table, in the workshop, in the garden, everywhere there are opportunities. A very good method for developing the sense of smell is the following. Get a dozen small jars and fill them with substances having strong and characteristic odors such as ammonia, chlorine, lemon essence, rose essence, etc. Then, blindfolded, try to identify each of the smells. As in the taste exercises, at first it may seem almost impossible to distinguish between such different smells as ammonia and rose essence, but with practice you will soon be able to discriminate between the more subtle smells. Tactile training. Finally, a word about the sense of touch. This is the most practical and, indeed, the most indispensable of all the faculties of perception. 
If you could not see or hear, you could survive anyway. But if you could not feel, you could not live even for a moment. It is the most universal and in a sense the most important sense of all. Yet few people, outside of specialized professions where the sense of touch is of utmost importance, have taken the trouble to develop it to its maximum efficiency. The sense of touch can be trained in many ways, but the main point to bear in mind is the need to discriminate between the different qualities of tactile impressions. A very good method for developing the sense of touch is as follows. Get yourself a dozen small objects, such as rubber balls, pieces of cloth, coins, buttons, etc. Then, blindfolded, try to identify each object by touch. Another very good method to develop the sense of touch is the following. Get yourself a dozen small boxes and fill them with different materials, such as sand, salt, sugar, flour, etc. Then, blindfolded, try to identify each of the materials by touch. As in the exercises for taste and smell, at first it may seem almost impossible to distinguish between such different materials as sand and sugar, but with practice you will soon be able to discriminate between the subtler qualities of tactile impressions. In short, the faculties of perception are the very basis of all mental power. The development of these faculties is not only possible, but is of the utmost importance for anyone who wishes to achieve mental supremacy. With a little practice, anyone can develop his perceptive faculties to an astonishing degree, and the development of these faculties is the basis of all mental power.